Good evening, good evening, and welcome everyone. We are so glad that you're here this evening for this uh, evangelist series, Prepare to Meet Thy God. Amen. How many people were here last night? Oh, amen. Praise God. Well, we're in for a treat over the next two weeks. Amen. Uh, just to let you know, uh, the schedule uh, will continue every single night. The only off night is what night? Thursday. All right. You all got it all together. Amen. I can assure you we're going to have a wonderful time in the Lord. Please invite as many of your friends and family members as possible. Amen. I believe that Jesus is coming soon, don't you? And I believe that there's a time where we're not going to hear messages like this anymore. And so we praise God for this type of opportunity to hear the word of God uh, from Evangelist uh, Lemon. Dr. Lemon, first question we want to ask is, doesn't it seem arrogant to say there's only one gospel? That's right. Okay, um, you know, we understand that question because when, last night we showed from the Bible that there is only one gospel that heaven is acknowledging at this time in earth's history. And of course that means that negates a lot of other movements that preach other gospels. So the question is understood. Doesn't it sound a bit arrogant? It's not arrogant, it's biblical. And you will find that, you know, there is a nice clear line between arrogance and that which is pertaining to the word of God. I'll give you an example in the book of Galatians chapter 1 and verse 9. I want you to hear what the Bible says and you can see that it is not an arrogant position but it is a biblical position to say there's only one gospel and I believe that this text will make it very plain. The Bible says in Galatians 1 and verse 9 it says as we said before so say I now again if any man preach what? Any other gospel unto you then that ye have received let him be accursed and that is what the scripture says and when it talks about the curse Paul has no power to put a curse on anybody so when Paul says let him be accursed he was saying let him fall under the curse of God so therefore the Bible is very clear that there is only one gospel message that heaven endorses. And that's why last night I showed you from Matthew 24, 14, that Jesus said, and this gospel. That's a definite statement. He did not say, and a gospel. He said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. So therefore, it is not arrogant. It is biblical. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one message Amen. that God has given to finish his work. Amen. Amen. Well said. Well Number two, out of 11, the next question says, what about big popular churches? How could they be wrong with so many followers? Well, you know, if you look in the days of Noah, there were a lot of followers of people that was not Noah. Right. <laughs> and they made up the majority. Yes. But at the same time, they were the ones lost. When you look at the days of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, there were many people, many followings that was outside of Lot. But those were the individuals that were burnt up in the flames. And therefore, we have nothing in the Bible that shows us. In fact, if you carefully study the Bible, you will see that the majority was never right. Unless you have a different view of majority. You see, I believe one person plus God is the majority. So if you look at it the way I look at it, then I do believe the majority is right. But if we're looking at the numerical amounts of individuals that make up churches and the fact that they're popular because they're the world and all these things lift these people up, by no means are these evidences or signs that God is working in these movements. So as a result of that, always remember 2 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 1, the Bible says that Rehoboam, it says he forsook the law of the Lord. And then later on in the same verse, 2 Chronicles 12, 1, it says, and all the people followed him. So here goes Rehoboam, popular leader, and he forsook the law of the Lord and the majority of the people followed him, but they were wrong. And therefore, we should never judge truth by the numbers of individuals that make up church congregations and so on. That is a very dangerous thing to do when we carefully study what the scriptures say. Okay, and finally, as the question is, as long as you preach Jesus came, died, and lives again to save, it's the right gospel, right? No. And, and let me tell you why. We would think that as long as a person says Jesus' name in a message, that it's the gospel. But when you study Matthew, the seventh chapter, in verse 21, Jesus himself said, many shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, 
Have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name have done many wonderful works? But in verse 23, the Bible says Jesus will say to those same people preaching in his name, people who was using his name and talking about him. He's going to say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So therefore, it is not enough simply to do that. You see, I, this one I wanted to address on the screen here. There is something, if you can go ahead, if I was uh, telling, giving them a signal to let them know at this time. If you look at the screen right here, there is something that was called present truth in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. Present truth is a gospel message that contains truths for the specific time in Earth's history. And here's an example of it. When you think of present truth, you think of Noah. Noah, the Bible lets us know, was a preacher of righteousness. But at the same time, Noah was giving a very specific present truth message. His message was a flood is coming. Get on the ark. You understand? So Noah was preaching the gospel. He was preaching righteousness. But at the same time, he was preaching truths specific for his time. So the people knew practically how to enter into the experience of the gospel. It wasn't just Noah. There was also Jonah. You remember Jonah to Nineveh. Jonah was also told to the people of Nineveh, tell them they have 40 days to get their act together. I'm going to destroy everything. And that was, again, a present truth message for those days in Jonah's day. And as Jonah gave that message. So, again, Jonah gave the gospel, but he commingled it with the truths for his time. Now, let's go on. How about John the Baptist? John the Baptist was preaching the gospel. The Bible specifically says that. But at the same time, John the Baptist said, prepare to meet thy God. And he was referring to the first advent of Jesus Christ. He was giving a present truth message for the time connected with the everlasting gospel of Jesus. Well, we also have the three angels messages. Remember that Revelation 14, 6 says that it's the everlasting gospel. So it is uplifting Christ our Savior. Jesus is never removed from it. But there's always a present truth application to the message. And that is what we studied last night in Revelation 14. So, in fact, we're actually being consistent with the history of the flow of the Bible. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. All right. All right. All right. Look forward to more questions. Write them down. And we look forward to answering them night after night. God bless you. Amen. Amen. So please, if you have, you have a question and you need a sheet of paper, you raise your hand. Your, our ushers will come to you, give you a sheet of paper, or as on your way exiting out, we'll make sure you get a sheet of paper so you can put one of the questions in the box. Amen? And so every night you have an opportunity to answer these type of questions. Amen. Well, at this time, we're so glad that uh, Evangelist uh, does not come alone. He comes also with his family. Amen? his lovely wife and his four children and, and this time he's also with his mother-in-law and so we want to say welcome uh, to the family at this time uh, but at, we would like to uh, as uh, we're about to transition uh, we would like to call Gerard uh, to give us the special music and the next voice that you will hear will be evangelist Duane Lemon
together where we get to study together. And every night, that's what we're seeking to do. We're seeking to study together because there's too much preaching and very little studying that is taking place in the houses of God today. And as a result of that, you have a lot of people who say amen to things that they really don't understand. You ever went to church and you heard a sermon and you said amen? Maybe you felt a, a, a feeling of emotion down your back. And then next thing you know, shortly, just maybe a few minutes or a few hours after you left the church service and somebody says, what did you learn today? And you are clueless. You don't even remember what you heard. This is happening all over the world right now. There are very few individuals that are really taking the time to study. And I read in the little book that states in place of so much sermonizing, God's people need to come together and study text by text to know what they believe. And tonight, I'm going to be honest with you, tonight is a crucial night because tonight we're addressing the question, is there really anything left that we can trust? And, and the reason why I pose this question is because we have learned since Saturday morning that the arms of flesh will fail us. We can't trust our money. We can't trust political powers. We learned that even our own hearts are so wicked, we can't even trust our own hearts. So when you're living in a time where it seems like everything around us is so untrustworthy, then obviously the question becomes relevant. Is there anything left that we can trust? And therefore, we're going to really talk about it, dealing with this subject about this little book right here, this book called the Bible, because it's amazing how there are so many people who go to churches and who go to various religious organizations, many of which they use this very little book here called the Bible, yet nobody is in agreement one with the other. And we see a lot of confusion and even some of those who profess to believe the Bible very strongly. You will find that many a times when they really come face to face with what the scriptures really are teaching. That a lot of people who thought they believe discover that they are, in fact, unbelievers. It is because of this that we're going to take our time tonight and we're going to go ahead and study through this topic. Can this book really be trusted? Because what is the point of the three angels' messages? What is the point of following all these end time events if at the end of the day we don't even know if this book is real? If we don't even know if it's inspired? If we don't even know if it's something that can really be trusted? And therefore, we're going to go through a nice little journey of question and answer that by the grace of God, in the end of it, we will have no doubt that this book was not put together by mere human effort, but it was supernaturally put together by a supernatural God. And therefore, as we prepare our hearts to go through this subject, as has been our custom, I would like to invite as much of you as are able to, that if you would please join with me. I'm going to kneel and I'm going to pray. And if you don't mind, I'm going to ask if you can kneel with me. And if you do not want to kneel, then you just reverently bow your heads where you are as we approach the Lord together. So let us pray. Loving Father, we are very grateful for the privilege and the opportunity that all the earth can keep silence while heaven speaks. And we want to hear your voice. We need to hear your voice. And I'm grateful that one of the great ways that you express your voice is through your words contained in the scripture. And Father, I'm just asking that in the midst of those of us who may be here and we have preconceived ideas, we have prejudices, we have maybe even points of conceit and arrogancy. We think we know it all. There's many attitudes that are perhaps even in our midst right now. I am asking that if necessary, may your power be so present here that those who need to be humbled will be humbled. That those who need to be enlightened will be enlightened. That those who are here and they are ignorant that they can leave intelligent. And that by your grace, we can leave here, most importantly, exercising faith in the truth of your words. We thank you for giving us this opportunity to study tonight. We ask you to please forgive us of our sins and may you grant us your spirit. And ultimately, let him be the teacher. For this is our prayer that we ask in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. I would like for you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Judges. We're going to go to the book of Judges, and we're going to look at Judges, the 25th chapter. Judges. It is in the book of Judges that there is a statement made that we would do well to consider. I'm so sorry, Judges 21. In Judges, the 21st chapter, we're going to go ahead and look at what the text says, and we're going to look at Judges 21, verse 25. So I was thinking Judges 25, 21. It is Judges 21, 
25. Well, the Bible says in Judges 21, in verse 25, and if you're there, please let me know by saying amen. Well, the Bible says in Judges 21, in verse 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and something happened as a result of this. What does the rest of the text say? It says, Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, if you had a concordance, if you had something where you could look up everywhere in the Bible where it talks about what people did in their own eyes, you will find that it was always going down the negative path. Yes. Now, there's a reason for that. The reason for that is because in Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, it tells us something about those who follow the inclination of their own eyes, their own hearts and their own minds. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, it tells us that our hearts are wicked are, are desperately wicked above all things. So therefore, we can't trust our own perceptions. In fact, go to the book of Proverbs 14. Let me show you this. I want to I want to show you the testimony of the very book that we're investigating. In Proverbs, the 14th chapter, a man by the name of Solomon, a man with tremendous experience in several ways, both good and bad. And the Bible says in Proverbs, the 14th chapter, and this is how imperative it is for you and I to understand you can't trust what you feel. You can't trust what you think. You can't trust what you think you understand. And the list goes on because the Bible says in Proverbs 14 and verse 12. And if we're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 14 and verse 12, it says there is a way which what? It seems right, it seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are what? The, way of the ways of death. Now, back in the days, you know, growing up with my father, my father was the kind of man that whenever he had to repeat himself, you know, that was dad's way of letting us know, I mean what I'm telling you. And every time my father had to repeat himself, he was trying to make it clear, do what I'm telling you to do, because if you don't do it, judgment lies at the door. You know, there was some serious repercussions for it. So any time I found that my father had to repeat himself, he was trying to impress upon my heart, I mean what I'm telling you. Well, so it is with God. Whenever God has to repeat himself, he is trying to impress upon the hearts of his people, I mean what I'm telling you. So in Proverbs 14, 12, we read, there is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are what? I wonder what Proverbs 16, 25 says. Let's go to Proverbs 16 and let's look at verse 25 and let's find out what it says there. In Proverbs 16, 25, just a couple of chapters over, same book, same uh, author, but here it is in Proverbs 16 and verse 25. What does it say? Same thing. It says, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. God is trying to let us know that we cannot trust ourselves. Back in the days, I used to hang out with a lot of brothers and they used to call themselves gods. They used to, we, we used to even address each other. Yo, what's up, God? What's going on, God? And, you know, everybody's calling each other God. But the truth of the matter is, is that we were nothing. We were just as ignorant as anybody else. But yet we were referring to ourselves as gods. And there are many people today that are going around calling themselves gods in different religious movements and so on. But at the end of the day, our own hearts are deceiving us. And therefore, there are false gods even in our own hearts that we're acknowledging and bowing down to. And God wants to debunk all these false gods. We cannot trust our hearts. We cannot trust what we think or feel because our own hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. It is because of this reality that we ask then, well, what can we trust? Because think about it. There are several religious books out there, several religious books, all sorts of religious persuasions that are out there. And sooner or later, somebody has to say, well, how do I know which one I can trust? And here it is in Christianity. Obviously, we have embraced this book called the Bible. But the question is, why the Bible? Why, why the Bible in comparison to others? Because I'm showing you all these things from Bible prophecy. I'm showing you all these things about end time events, but at the end of the day, can this book really be trusted? Is this book trustworthy? Can I really count on it? And therefore, the first question we're going to ask is, well, what does the Bible even claim about itself? Because you're going to find a little phrase, and I want you to repeat this phrase with me if you don't mind. I promise you I will never try to do anything to deceive you, so what I'm going to say to you is safe. I want you to try to repeat this with me if you don't mind. Scripture is the key, is the key. That, unlocks that unlocks scripture. scripture. Let's try that one more time. Does it sound safe? Yes. All right. Now, now I can see you repeat. I saw some of you not moving your lips. You're nervous. Don't be nervous. What I'm telling you is the truth. Let's try it again. Scripture, scripture. 
is the key that unlocks scripture. Don't ever forget that. Today, when somebody wants to understand scripture, you know what we do? We go to human keys. Did you catch that? Today, when many of us want to understand scripture, we go to human keys. We go to people and say, can you do me a favor? Unlock what this scripture is saying when God says, wait a minute, scripture is the key that unlocks scripture. The Bible can interpret and explain itself. And as a result of this, I want you to see that. So watch what the scripture says about itself. The Bible makes it very clear. It says how much scripture? Now, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, what does the word inspiration mean? Look at what, it's right there in front of you. The word inspiration means what? God breathed. So in other words, when scripture was given, God was breathing information to individuals. And we're going to break down this breathing and make it even more plain. God was breathing information to individuals' minds. And then their minds saw it heard it, received it, and then they wrote it. Yes. Now watch this. The first thing we learned here is it says how much scripture? Oh. Now this is from the book of 2 Timothy. Is that right? Yes. Well, we got the first lesson that we just learned. How many of you have ever heard of this group of individuals called New Testament, script, New Testament Christians? You ever met people like that? I'm a New Testament Christian. I remember I meet people and they, they would have a Bible in their hand and the Bible did not have the Old Testament. It only had the New Testament. They call themselves New Testament Christians. Well, I have some information, especially if there's anybody in here under that persuasion. When it says all scripture, when Timothy or when Paul was inspired to write this term all scripture, do you know there was no New Testament in existence? So in other words, when Paul says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, he was actually talking about the Old Testament. So for individuals who go around saying, well, you know, I don't I don't like to listen to Old Testament, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant and all these other foul interpretations. These are not the truth. Paul makes it clear all scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament was given by God's inspiration. God was breathing this. So let's look at this whole thing about inspiration and let's break it down even more. Notice in the next point, Second Peter 1, 21, the Bible says prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. So nobody just woke up and said, I feel like writing the Bible. Nobody just woke up and said, you know what? I just feel like jotting down a bunch of my opinions. It says the prophecy came not by the will of man, but what kind of men? It says, but holy men of God spake as they were what? Moved by the Holy Ghost. So when the scripture was put together, it did not come because somebody just woke up and said, I feel like writing. They were moved or shall I say inspired. And as they were inspired, then they were able to speak the words of God. You following so far? Now watch this. It gets even sweeter because look at this next point. Second Samuel 23 two, David in gives us a key on how we can understand how this thing came together called the Bible. Look at what it says. It says the spirit of the Lord did what? spake by me and then what did he do and his words were in my tongue so now let's put all these scriptures together how much scripture is given by inspiration of God oh. all of it inspiration means what God breathed well it says how did this whole God breathing information to people happen it says holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost well wait a minute what does it mean the Holy Ghost moved them? David says, the Spirit of the Lord did what? He spake by me. In other words, he spoke to me, and then his words were now upon my tongue as I spoke. Yeah. Now, you know something I learned? It's such a practical lesson. Do you know something you do every time you speak? You breathe. Yes. It's such a simple thing, but sometimes simplicity passes us. Every time you and I speak, we are breathing. So in other words, when the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, God breathed. What it's saying is not that God went to somebody's head and went and blew at him. That's not what the text is saying. What the text is saying is that God was breathing because he was speaking. 
And God was speaking his words to the minds of holy men of God. And as they heard the words of God, now God's words were upon their tongues. And then they spoke the word of God. This is how the Bible testifies of inspiration. So the first lesson we understand is that the spirit of God is the author of scripture. It is not Moses. It is not Isaiah. It is not Daniel or Ezekiel or the Apostle Paul or Peter or any of these individuals. The spirit of God is the one who was the speaker. These men I just mentioned were the listeners. And then as they listened under this inspiration effect of God, then they spoke the words of God. And there were scribes who wrote it down, of which today you and I have this little book called the Bible. So this is what the Bible is testifying about itself. Now, the reason why this becomes important is because now let's get to the meat of it. Let's address some of these issues. One of the first of which is, well, wait a minute. I thought that the Bible contradicts itself. This is what literally I grew up hearing this. I grew up in Hollis, Queens in New York. And in Hollis, Queens in New York during, you know, the 1980s, 1990s and so on, when I was growing up in this era, there was a lot of other persuasions. Because I was growing up and engrossed in the hip hop culture, there was a lot of uh, what the movement called Nuwabians, the, the, the five percenters, you know, the different offshoot Islamic groups and all these things, Rastafarian, and the list goes on. So this is what I'm surrounded by, the Hebrew Israelites, the black quote unquote Hebrew Israelites. So this is everything that I'm surrounded by. So all of these individuals would put down the Bible. They would say, no, nah, man, the Bible can't be trusted. They would say everything from it's a white man's book all the way down to it contradicts itself. And they would give me every evidence they had to try to prove these points point by point. So I started to hear it. And of course, as an ignorant child, I just bought into it like a lot of ignorant people buy into it today because they don't do careful research. So here it is that I'm going around and I'm telling everybody, man, that's a white man's religion. It's this, it's that. That book can't be trusted. And one of the things was it contradicts itself. So therefore, we're going to address this. Does the Bible really contradict itself or could it be that there's some things we need to keep in mind? Let me give you the first point. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, please. When we go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we have to understand something about Scripture. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, and I want you to look at it. Because we're going to need to consider this as we start going through our journey of really finding out, can this book be trusted or can it not? So in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, and I want you to see what the Bible says in verse 14. People actually believe they can just pick this book up, study it, and understand it. There are people who believe this, okay? There are people all over the world that believe all I got to do is pick the book up and study it like I study any other book in school. But notice what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. The Bible says, but the what kind of man? Natural. It says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. Well, we just learned one of the things of the spirit of God is that he spoke the words of God. So notice that the natural man, can he understand the word of God? Can he just simply pick up the book and read it and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I understand it. Can he do that? No, not according to the testimony of Scripture. Look at what it says next. It says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what unto him? They are foolishness unto him. So then it says, they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So there are individuals like myself, a time in my life, I thought I could just pick up this book and just start reading it, and I could just understand it and break it down, because I understood mathematics and science and all these other things. But the Bible's testimony of itself says, no, 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 no. In your natural mind, you can't not only not understand the Bible, it will appear like foolishness to you. And that's exactly what I called it. I used to say the Bible was filled with foolishness. But it says that I'm not spiritually discerned. There's something where the spirit of God is not guiding my mind. And if he's not guiding my mind, then I cannot understand rightly this book. So therefore, in order to understand the Bible, you and I cannot approach it in our simple, natural mind and just think, well, I'm going to just read it and I'm going to just see if I understand it. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So because of this, there are many things that can appear like contradictions that in fact are not. Let me give you some examples. The first thing is this. We need to understand that the Bible is what inspired? inspired. Now, it is what inspired? Thought inspired, not what? Pen inspired. Let me break that down. What that means is, therefore, its words do not have to be repeated verbatim by other writers. When somebody believes something is pen inspired, that means that every dot, 
every comma, every T cross, every exclamation point, every single thing has to be 100% correct because the power of inspiration is guiding not just the mind, but also guiding the hand. The Bible was not pen inspired. It was thought inspired. God had thoughts in his mind that he shared with the mind of man and man was able to write and record it according to the leading of God's spirit. So when we understand that, we should not expect things in the Bible to be repeated verbatim by the other writers at every time. And I'm gonna give you an example. Here's an actual case of individuals who use this to say, see, the Bible can't be trusted. I'm gonna show you, right here. In Zechariah 12 and verse 10, it's a messianic prophecy where it says, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness as one who is in bitterness for his firstborn. So when you look at this verse right here, we would say, okay, well, this is a messianic prophecy, and it's talking about one who's going to be pierced, and those who look at him are going to go through this mourning and this sorrow. Well, later on in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, chapter 19 and verse 37, John is now repeating the prophecy of Zechariah. Notice what he says. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And John was applying it to Jesus. Did you know that some people actually will say the Bible is not inspired? And you know one of the reasons why? Because it says, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. But the verse here says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. And they say, hey, John messed with the words. John didn't put me versus him and therefore it can't be trusted do you know people actually make cases like this today and will actually tell you the bible can't be trusted because it doesn't say it verbatim like how the other prophet said it but listen when we understand that scripture is thought inspired my question is is the thought in zechariah 12 10 the same thought in john 19 37 is it the same thought Yes, it is. So when we understand thought inspiration, we don't have any problem between Zechariah 12, 10 and John 19, 37. You follow? Amen. Now watch this. Next one. Some say because a portion of a text is missing does not mean manipulation has taken place. In other words, what if someone repeated a text of scripture? But this time, it's not just the changing of words, but let's say a whole portion of the scripture is removed. Individuals will say, you see that? The Bible can't be trusted. Here's another example. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. In Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Now watch it carefully, and just to help you, I highlighted the point that's going to be the argument. In Isaiah 61, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and what else? It says, the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. So notice this is what Isaiah's prophecy is bringing out. Now Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus comes on the scene many centuries later when Christ comes on the scene Jesus is now in a synagogue as his custom was on the Sabbath day and as he's there he grabs the scroll of Isaiah and when Jesus grabs the scroll of Isaiah he begins to read but notice there's a portion that's missing watch in Luke 4 verses 18 and 19 watch what the Bible says here the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus is literally reading this because you'll see that I didn't put it up here. But in verse 21, Jesus says this scripture is being fulfilled in your ears. He's literally saying I'm fulfilling it. Now watch. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then it just stops. In other words, he cut a portion out of the quote. What part did he cut out? He cut out the day of vengeance. Are you following? He cut that out. Now, somebody will say, you see that? New Testament can't be trusted. It's mutilating the scripture. It's taking portions of the scripture out. No. Do you know why Jesus did not say the day of vengeance? Because it wasn't time for him to say that part of the scripture. What do I mean? Well, think about it. In Christ's earthly ministry, did he do all of these things? Yes, he did. He ministered to the poor. He definitely healed the brokenhearted. He visited the captive. He did all of that, didn't he? Here's my question. Did he take vengeance upon the enemies of God? 
Did he do that in his first advent? No, he did not. That's why we need to pay attention to Luke 21. Go to Luke 21. You see, in Luke 21, let's find out when the vengeance part takes place. In Luke, the 21st chapter, notice what the Bible says. You see, there are a lot of things that appear like contradictions, contradictions, manipulations, extractions, and all these other things that individuals will use to say this book can't be trusted anymore. But it's not true to the careful student of Scripture. The Bible says in Luke, the 21st chapter, right there in verse 22, Jesus was given all these end time events of which one of them was the destruction of Jerusalem. When he talked about the destruction of Jerusalem, notice what he says in Luke 21 and verse 22. It says, for these be the days of what? Vengeance. Vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. When was Jerusalem destroyed? It was destroyed A.D. 70. Was that after Christ had already been dead, buried and resurrected? Yes. Yes. So that means that Jesus's earthly ministry is completely over. Is that right? Yes. So here it is that Jesus did not quote the day of vengeance piece from Isaiah 61 because it did not apply to his earthly ministry. When the day of vengeance comes, it was going to come in a future tense way down in the future later on in time. Do you understand? Yes. So there are a lot of things that can appear like contradictions. Things that can appear like extractions. But when we carefully study the scripture, we can see, no, it's not a contradiction. It's not an extraction. It's not any of those things. It's just that if we study the Bible in our natural mind, these truths will appear like foolishness. And this is why God wants us to be led by his spirit as we study his words that we may come to a faithful knowledge of truth. Well, let's go on. You'll remember that the Bible tells us this. And this is powerful. This is, did you know that this was another reason why individuals used to believe the Bible could not be trusted? They said, well, the Bible, there, there are many other books in the Bible. And some of them would say the lost books of Eden and all these different things, right? Did you know that one of the arguments they would use is from this quote right here, Genesis 1? They would say, well, notice what Genesis 1, 28 says. It says, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and do what? Replenish the earth. Did you know a lot of people had a problem with that verse? Because, you know, the most widely studied Bible in North America is the King James Version. It's actually still the King James Version. So in the King James Version, that word replenish is being used. In some of these lost books of Eden and all these other things, they tell you that there were people that existed before Adam and Eve. There are certain movements that will tell you there were the Adamites and the Evites, all these people who existed. And they'll say, your Bible proves it. And you would say, how so? They would say, how could Adam and Eve replenish something that was never populated? Is that a legitimate question? That, that's a legitimate question. You understand? You see, preaching is not always about getting everybody to feel hype and stuff. I'm talking to your brains, brothers and sisters. I'm reasoning with your mind because when you do evangelism, when you're sharing truth with people, these are the kind of questions they're going to throw at you and you got to have something better to say than well, all I know is I was once blind, but now I can see. Because <laughs> this is what people say. They get all emotional and, and, and function in these emotional religions and they're no longer intelligent thinking Christians. That is a legitimate question. If Adam and Eve were the first human beings on earth. How could they possibly replenish the earth? That is a legitimate question. But do you know how you answer it? It's very simple. The Bible was not written in English, was it? It was written in what language? Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek. Original languages. When we're dealing with Genesis one, that 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 language would be Hebrew. So I looked up the word Hebrew on replenish. I wonder what it meant. Hebrew, male, it simply means to fill. What does it mean? To fill. to fill. So God was saying to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now watch this. When God said it to Noah, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Did he have to fill the earth again? Yes, he did. But is replenish more applicable to Noah? Yes, because the earth was already populated. You understand? So when we study the Bible, these are the things that we have to understand. While I'm thankful that God does touch our emotions, 
I am glad that we deal with a holistic God that ministers to our mental, our physical, our spiritual, our emotional and social. We must understand that in order to faithfully understand the Bible, these are the real questions that people are going to ask you on a day to day basis and tell you, this is why I don't believe your Bible or your religion. So God's people have to have an answer that we can give to them that can be a benefit to them to help remove these scales of darkness and bless them with the light of God's word and his truth. Remember, truth always does something. According to John 8, and verse 32, the Bible says, and you shall know the truth and the truth is going to make you free. 